over at bangthebook.com. We are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. Updated NFL power ratings piece with model projections from Danny Vorgs for the four NFL games here this weekend. Definite must read. 57% lifetime on those from Danny Vorgs over there at the website. Daily NHL picks from Parker Michaels. He's doing a fantastic job this season. Daily college basketball picks from Kyle Hunter. He's off to a fantastic start with uh, this first round of of daily picks pieces that he's been doing. So another one coming your way here today. Situational betting articles, picks and predictions for the NBA, college basketball, soccer, you name it, we got it over at bangthebook.com. Again, make sure you check out our free pick contests and our sportsbook reviews as well. As you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook, BTB200. That promo code will get you a 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino. Both of those up to $500 at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. And then, of course, head on over to YouTube.com, search Bang the Book, uh, subscribe to our page, get our videos. I do six of them a week, and then we get Brian Blessing on them as well. And once Kyle Hunter's feeling better, he'll be doing some free pick videos and some betting tip videos and things of that sort on our YouTube page as well. Two guests on the program here today. We start things off with Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com. Brad, how's it going today, man? All right. Well, (laughs) Brad got one word in, and then uh, the call dropped. So hopefully we can get him back on the line here in a couple of seconds. As I said, we're going to chat about the four NFL divisional round games with Brad and then also that transition uh, into college basketball with college football now uh, out of the way until we get to, I guess, really not ever out of the way, as Brad and I will probably talk about here in a second. But, Brad, how's it going today, man? Man, it's going well. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> on me, I, I hit the, the end call uh, on accident. That's okay. That's all good. I mean, I, I get it. College yeah, football is over. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you don't want to do this anymore now that college football is over. <laughs> No, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. We still like the college hoops uh, side of it, but uh, what will I say? Is it more like a job now instead of a, a passion? Yeah, I, I, we get a little bit of that in the month of January. Well, let me touch on this with you here, and we're going to find a way to work college football into every segment you do. I mean, it's just kind of the way that it goes here with you. But you know, you know, I'm a big baseball guy. MLB season win totals already out at Caesars Palace. And you and I talk about this all the time with regards to college football and the accelerated timelines. Season win totals will be out before we know it. Games of the year lines will be out before we know it. It's not like you put college football away and just ignore it for a while. No, that's a great question. And I figured you would ask something about it. But uh, in a big-time accelerated process, what, an extra month early compared to what they normally are as far as the Major League Baseball. And and I got a feeling uh, that particular book, Caesars, uh, is going to pr- probably try to beat South Point to the punch this year when it comes to a lot of that college football stuff, and that's the case. I mean, it's already a pretty accelerated process with a lot of the uh, the football stuff coming out Memorial Day weekend in May. Uh, if that gets jumped up an extra few weeks or a month, then I can't you know take my eye completely off the ball when it comes to college football. A lot, a lot of stuff to get through here in the next three months. Obviously, college basketball is first and foremost, but uh, when it comes to the, the football, you, you keep an eye on those early entries as far as the NFL draft picks. Keep an eye here in three weeks as the teams close out their recruiting classes. And, and then you start diving in. Schedules get you know, officially announced for, for pretty much all the teams. Most of the Power Fives are done right now as far as schedules for the upcoming season. But you get the schedules announced for the group of five teams, and away you go. You, you try to get a basing, start, starting line power rated base as best as you can. and uh, if we're going to have to bet season win totals in April this year, then, then I'm all for it. Well, I mean, it's certainly a possibility. My guess would be, and, and I haven't talked to Matt about this, but my guess would be that almost immediately following March Madness, they're going to look to get these college football numbers up there maybe a week or two after that to you know generate some more buzz, get some more publicity, get some more people in the book. Because, you know, I mean, yeah, the NBA playoffs, the NHL playoffs draw a little bit. Major League Baseball – has gotten a little bit more popular here over the last you know, two or three years with uh, so many modelers and so many quant guys in the market, but they're going to be looking for that bump from college football. So I would certainly think by mid-April, uh, you're going to have to be on top of things there. And hell, I mean, I, I saw that the Westgate Superbook is going to allow people to start signing up for the Super Contest 
on March 1st. It used to be July 1st. <laughs> now March 1st. Everything is just – there. there's no off season. I don't care what market it is. There's no off season anymore. No, there isn't. Uh, and th- that's why I think specialization is so important. Uh, I mean, look, look, look at kids today. I, I mean, you know, 20, 30 years ago, kids played three different sports in high school. Now they're taught to, to play one. And I think we're starting to see that uh, in, in the betting. I mean, if you're worried about, you know, and you got to to a certain extent. I mean, most people, they, you know, jump around at least do a couple of sports. But uh, if you do way too many, then, then you're going to be losing out, as, at least from a betting aspect you're going to be missing out on a lot of opportunities because the softest lines of the year will be some of these early season uh, illiquid markets. All right, so let's get into the NFL here, a market that is still going on. NFL playoffs, divisional round, four games coming up here this weekend, two next weekend, a week off, then the Super Bowl. So we've only got seven NFL games left for this season. But we'll start with game 301, 302. Colts and Chiefs. Chiefs anywhere from a five, five and a half point favorite out there in the offshore market. Number opened four, got as high as six, met a point of resistance and came back down a little bit. So we're sitting in that dead zone, Brad. Which way do you think this line's going to move? I, I want to say towards Indy a little bit. I, I mean, if you're looking at the last 11 games, I could argue Indy might be uh, the Colts are the best team in the NFL, 10-1, and uh, last 11, and it makes a certain extent why they started off slow and now they're red hot. I mean, Andrew Luck had to test out his shoulder. It looks 100% healthy now, but at the start of the season, he didn't look quite 100%. They didn't throw it down the field much. Indy's got a new head coach, Frank Reich. He was ironing out the kinks, uh, had that you know, obviously that bad decision in the Houston game that, that probably cost them at least a tie in overtime early in the season. They've hired not the kinks there. And then, you know, you know, make a strong case that Indy relies on their young players more than any other team in the NFL. I mean, they're the first team since 1965 to have a pair of rookies make the all-pro team. So they're trending upward. So, I mean, to me, if you got the best team possibly in the NFL – uh, and you're catching, you know, more than, than what, uh, you know, perceived to be here, obviously three points home field advantage. They're still thinking Kansas City's, you know, a point and a half, two points, uh, two and a half points better than, than Indy on a neutral. I don't see that. And on the flip side, Kansas City's, you know, not the same team as what they were at the start of the season. Here's a team that's covered just one time in their last seven. Why? Well, Kareem Hunt's been, been out a majority of that. They, they haven't been explosive as much on offense. And I got a head coach in Andy Reid that, notoriously uh, that doesn't finish the season as strong as what he does at the start of the season. So add it all up for me. I'm on the Colts here. Well, and, and here's, there's a lot going on with this game. I think complex handicaps. I think last week I had some pretty good positions and some pretty good thoughts on all four games this week. I feel like a lot of these games are very, very difficult in this one here. You've got Indianapolis, third straight road game, a situation we'll obviously talk about with the Chargers in a couple of minutes. You've got an Indianapolis team that, as you just mentioned, you know, Andrew Luck missed essentially two years. So this is a large and heavy workload on this guy, now 17 games into the season. Two rookies on defense make the all-pro team. You know, so, or, well, they, I guess they had the one on the offensive line and one on defense, but they're a very young defense, too. They've played 17 games as well. Third straight road game you got to wonder if maybe fatigue becomes a little bit of a factor for the Colts. Also, Andy Reid, very, very good off of buys with extra prep time. That's an angle starting to get some run. But you broke it down in terms of the two teams and where they currently are, what they're doing well, what they're not doing well. It's hard to sort through all of the noise and all of the different information that's out here and really prioritize what matters to you in these games. I mean, there's no question the situational spot's a negative for, for, for the Colts here, but uh, I can argue I get a third straight road trip. But it's not like they've been going across the country. They went to Tennessee. They went down to Houston. And now they're in KC. So, I mean, for the most part, they're staying in the same time zone. It's very unlike what the Chargers have been doing here the last three weeks. A lot more miles for them compared to the Colts. And, you know, if it was going to show up uh, at least a little bit, wouldn't have last week when they played in the final, as far as the the regular season, they played in the Sunday night football window, and then they had to turn around and play in the first window on a Saturday. But yet you flip on that game, and uh, it's the Colts jumping out 14 nothing, showing 
no rust, and it's not like they've been extended. Uh, they've dominated both the, the Titans and the Texans the last couple of weeks. It's not like those two games went down to the wire. Colts had that game, both games, pretty much in hand for the most part. Uh, so I think that might be getting a little overplayed uh, as far as I'm concerned. And, and you know, and you could talk about Andrew Luck and, and the workload, but I, one thing I've seen from him is in, in September, October, November, he didn't have a single game where he ran the football more than five times. Now in four of the last five games, he's got six or more carries in each game. So, I mean, he's going all out as far as, you know, doing everything it takes to, to win. And, and, again, I'm not seeing any – tiredness from the Colts whatsoever uh, I'll gladly take that narrative out there uh, that, that's in the marketplace and, and I'd be more inclined to fade it all right so you like Indianapolis as the side here certainly getting five five and a half you know I mean you, you can make a case that, that is very attractive because as you said you know three points for home field who is the better team right now who would you favor on a neutral maybe it's a pick em type of scenario something like that so the question then Brad are you sprinkling the money line here too or are you just going to look you know, take the plus points. Yeah, I'll take the plus points. I'll sprinkle a little bit of money line uh, for me. Uh, it's not like bowl season where, <laughs> I mean, that there's going to be a lot of high variance. Uh, you look at it, uh, I mean, teasers have been pretty profitable. If you look last week, a lot of these lines are relatively sharp. I mean, we are dealing with what should be the sharpest lines in any sport uh, in the entire betting calendar year down the, the stretch here in the last seven games of the football season because the entire world's betting it. Uh, and we've gotten, you know, the, uh, an appropriate sample size now finally when it comes to football. So uh, a little bit of, uh, on the money line for me, but uh, I'll have my bigger bet as far as uh, the plus five and a half goes. All right, let's examine the total on this game then. Total of 57. And, you know, speaking of Andy Reid again, a very uh, overriding perception of Andy Reid, maybe not even perception, it was a fact that Andy Reid would get very conservative late in football games. To this point this season, that really hasn't been the case as much, but obviously now that we get to the playoffs where the games matter a little bit more, maybe he reverts back to his old ways. So how do you approach this total of 57? Yeah, I don't think he can get conservative. I mean, I would say arguably the weakest unit left in the playoffs is probably Kansas City's defense. So, I mean, I don't think you go conservative on offense and trust that Kansas City defense to make some stops here. So, I'd be really surprised if he buttons down the hatches on offense. I mean, I well, I'd be surprised, but I might be happy because if that's the case, then I'll feel even better about my Indianapolis ticket. No, I think he's got to continue to – to keep the foot on the gas pedal. But, uh, I mean, there might be uh, some conservativeness early. Uh, I mean, keep in mind, first playoff start for Mahomes. And uh, I'll tell you, it, you go back through it, uh, these first playoff starts for a lot of these young quarterbacks have not always been a good look. Ask Lamar Jackson last week, Deshaun Watson last week. Playoffs are in a completely different t- type of season and atmosphere and pressure. So it may- maybe he eases in a little bit early, but – uh, I would be stunned if he keeps it conservative throughout. Uh, I think that that would spell the doom for the Chiefs just because I, I can't trust, and neither should Andy Reid trust that defense to, to make stop after stop against a high-powered Colts offense. Now, I have had a few people reach out on Twitter, and, and this is something I will talk about with Kyle Hunter for our segment on Friday, but I want to get your thoughts as well here, Brad, that I've had several people reach out and say that they've got Colts futures prices Some of them have very good prices. I think some have them in the 75 to 1 range in that type of area. What do you think from a hedging standpoint here this week? I mean, obviously you like Indianapolis. Would you hedge with Kansas City money line, Kansas City to win the AFC? Do you get creative with this? Do you wait and see if you need to hedge live? What what would your recommendation be uh, for somebody who's maybe holding something like a Colts 75 to 1, maybe all the way down to 30 to 1? Yeah, I mean, you're still dealing with three games left, and you'd be taking a big chunk out of your profits by continuing. I would wait to do it live a little bit uh, and see you feel yourself out early in the game. I wouldn't do too much. I mean, just feel good that you got a really good ticket in your hand right now. But, again, they got to win three games for you to cash that ticket. Uh, and if you start hedging now, I mean, you're, you're really taking the, a lot of the value out of that ticket. So I'd, I'd wait to do it live a little bit, uh, they get a little Kansas City money line uh, to see how they, they, both teams start off. But, 
I, I personally I wouldn't hedge too much because because I do like the Colts so much in this particular game. So uh, at least how I would handle it going in, I wouldn't do anything until live uh, in game wagering. Yeah, I mean I think that's a good strategy, and and also too, I mean you're talking about an Indianapolis team that's that's been playing. You know, in Kansas City didn't play last week. You mentioned Mahomes with that first start. Maybe some nerves, maybe some jitters, maybe something like that. Maybe you get Kansas City money line. Minus 115, minus 125, maybe even plus money uh, if they get off to a really bad start here in this one. So I think live is the way to go if you have the capability to do that. If not, we'll expand on that a little bit more on tomorrow's segment. But let's go to the next divisional round game here Saturday night, Dallas and the Rams. Rams seven-point favorite, extra juice pretty much market-wide. Interestingly enough, for the second time this week, my bookie, one of the more publicly driven shops in the offshore market, down to six and a half again. I think I saw this on Monday. Uh, now we're seeing it here again on Thursday. So, Brad, what do you think about this one with the Rams essentially laying a touchdown? Yeah, I don't have as strong as an opinion. Uh, here's what I do see. Uh, on one hand, the home away splits, uh, I think there's uh, that had me leaning towards the Rams. I mean, Dallas traditionally actually a below average home team if you're going against the spread and an above average road team. That wasn't the case this year. Cowboys were much better at home, eight and one at home, outscored their opponents by six points per game on the road. They were just three and five, getting outscored by five points per game. So eleven points. If you're saying of all things equal, home field advantage is around three points. I mean, there's an eleven point difference there between uh, the the Dallas side of things as far as the disparity this year. And you look at Jared Goff home away. I mean, at home, twenty two touchdowns, three interceptions on the road. It's pretty much even. Ten touchdowns, nine interceptions. So that would have me leaning towards the Rams. But concerns for me, a couple. Rams against winning teams this year. Last seven games against winning teams, zero covers. Zero covers against winning teams. And I just talked home away. Is that going to be really a true home away atmosphere there in the Coliseum? I'm not so sure. I mean, I wouldn't be stunned if the crowd's 50-50. Uh, there in the Coliseum. I was just in the Coliseum for a Notre Dame USC game, and it was like 60 40. I mean, there's a lot of fair weather fans when it comes to <laughs> uh, the LA sports. I mean, there's just better things to do. And Dallas, very passionate, very big uh, fan base there, gobble up a lot of tickets. So uh, I don't think if you're giving the Rams a full three points of home field advantage, I think that's kind of a mistake in this uh, instance. Now, we talked a little bit about Andy Reid in the previous game, and and I really harped on this point in the Seahawks versus Cowboys game. The coaching advantage that Seattle had with Pete Carroll against Jason Garrett, the problem is that Brian Schottenheimer really gave a lot of that advantage back, uh, just not calling a very good game for Seattle at all whatsoever. I have to think Sean McVay is better here this week, but of course, you know, we thought Sean McVay would be pretty good going into the playoffs last year, and the Rams laid a gigantic egg against the Falcons in that wild card round. So how much does that factor into the handicap for you this week with, you know, Sean McVay, not only being a better head coach than Jason Garrett, maybe a less experienced head coach, but also formerly the offensive coordinator of the Redskins. So he knows this Rod Marinelli defense. Yeah. I mean, that's an excellent point. I mean, there's no question about a coaching advantage uh, for the Rams, especially uh, considering that uh, Jason Garrett, much more old school, much more conservative, uh, the new school analytics guys obviously are in love with, with Sean McVay, but you know it's still zero playoff wins for, for him, so a little bit of concern. But but I do like how the Rams handled their business at the end of the season. A couple of blowout wins to end it that they rested Gurley. I think it's a question mark. If Ty Gurley's 100, percent that's a major concern for Dallas, and we haven't seen Gurley 100 percent for you know at the last month or so of the regular season. So uh, that might have been part of the struggles, part of the reason for the struggle for the Rams. Uh, it, does it factor in? Uh, of course it does to a certain extent. But, uh, I mean, until McVay comes out and proves it come playoff time, I mean, he's arguably one of the better regular season coaches in the last two years. Until he really proves it come playoff time, I don't know if it's a significant advantage in this instance. All right, so let me ask you about this here then. Uh, you know, you mentioned teasers and, and how well they, you know, pretty much worked out for everybody last week. You can't tease through the seven, but you can tease off of the seven here for the Rams. So it's not a completely optimal teaser, but at least you are getting that seven from a push. 
to a win. Is that something you would advocate here this week, taking the Rams down to, you know, minus one or, or minus a half a point? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, you're right. It's not optimal through seven and through three in that, that all-important corridor of three to seven. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, necessarily positive <laughs> – EV, you know, teasing seven, getting off of that, you know, as far as long term. But, yeah, I mean, if you're looking to tease, uh, the Rams and the Saints uh, sound pretty good to me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I would definitely – I'll have – I'll be perfectly frank. I'll have a small bet on the Rams and the Saints, a uh, uh, two-team six-point teaser, teasing both teams down for, to basically having to win the game. All right, so how about the total for this game here? Sitting 49 and really haven't seen a whole lot of movement. I mean, the previous game up from 55 and a half or 55 to 57 with some of the uh, softer openers that were out there. This one, the total really hasn't budged a whole lot. Uh, do you have any opinion on it? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, directionally speaking, I, I think if you're leaning towards the Dallas side, uh, I'm uh, I'm thinking you got to think it's lower scoring. Uh, I mean, Dallas can ill afford to get in a shootout here, in my opinion. If they're going to win it, it's going to be, you know, kind of a grinded out old school game where, where they control the line of scrimmage. They run the football uh, against the Rams uh, that has a questionable rush defense, and, and they, they get after Gurley. So uh, I think if you're leaning towards the Dallas side under, if you're thinking – you know, McVay can dial up with that extra time to prep. He can dial up, uh, you know, and generate uh, some points schematically. And then, then I think if you're leaning towards the Rams, it's more of the over. So so nothing earth-shattering here from me. Uh, if you lean favorite, probably the over uh, would be the preferred side dog, uh, more, more towards the under. Well, and of course, as I mentioned earlier in the week, and as I'll keep mentioning here when we talk about these games, Rams dead last in the NFL in yards per carry allowed. So, you know, if you do want to take the Rams here laying yep. a seven, you got to hope that Wade Phillips does something to stop Ezekiel Elliott and that Dallas rushing attack. Let's transition over to Sunday here, Brad. Game 305-306. Chargers on the road for a third straight week, taking on the New England Patriots, going cross-country for a second straight week. Chargers down from five to four. What do you think about the move here, Brad? I don't agree with it. Uh I'll take the pass. I get it. The Chargers have, you know, the better roster. But, I mean, are are, are you kidding me with this? I mean, the Chargers in the last three weeks have traveled now more than 10,000 miles. 10,000 miles in three weeks. If you count the round trip to Denver, round trip to Baltimore, and flying to the Boston area, 10,000-plus miles. New England in that same time frame, zero, zero miles. That's a significant advantage that I don't think's fully getting grasped in the line. I mean, you look at the path at the Patriots last seven times coming off the bye in the playoffs, they've won all seven at the average margin of victory, 17 points per game. That's another positive for the Patriots. Patriots, uh, best home team. Uh, you can make a, a very strong case. Best home team in the NFL this season outscored their opponents by 16 points per game. Dating back to last year, they won 15 games in a row at home. I get it. The Chargers are probably the best road team in the NFL. I haven't lost a single game outside of the city of Los Angeles this year. So uh, maybe that's getting a little bit overpriced. You look at quarterback matchup, historically, Tom Brady versus Phillip Rivers. Brady 7-0, and straight up 6-1 and against the number. The, the, the line says it's going to be close or at least comp- like a very competitive game. Now, I don't think you can get a bigger mismatch than Bill Belichick versus Anthony Lynn as far as, you know, when it comes to making the right decisions or with a game on the line. So add it all up for me. I, I get it that they might not be as good as past editions, but I'll take the Patriots. I'll fall on the sword if it goes down in flames, but I, I like the Patriots quite a bit. It's It's by far my favorite play of the week. Well, and I had a, a, a viewer comment on the YouTube video I did yesterday looking ahead to this weekend's games, feeling like I'm overblowing this spot for the Chargers, saying, you know, well, why didn't you mention the Chargers are 8-1 and on the road? And, well, technically they're 9-1 and on the road because they also won what was classified as a home game in London. The difference is they didn't play a third straight road game at any point this year. They did play four yeah. games away from home in a row, but there was a bye week in between coming off of that London game. It's a different kind of animal. Going back on the road three straight weeks, cross-country twice, back-to-back 10 a.m. kickoffs. Oh, and by the way, you get get the most profitable duo in the NFL over the last 
you know, 20 years in Belichick and Brady. It's just, I feel like what the Chargers did on the road, very, very impressive. Don't get me wrong. I just don't think it really has the same impact in this game with this spot, with this matchup. You're not going to get any disagreement from me. Uh, and but I, I guess, I mean, that's why I don't understand why the line's only four here. I mean, uh, I, maybe the Chargers and the Chargers, uh, which stunning to me is the Chargers, you know, had money bet against them last week in the Ravens game. And I was, I was all Chargers. I mean, Chargers last week uh, to my VIP clients, that, that was the pick I gave out over the Ravens. Raven. So I'm not anti-Chargers and, and by any stretch of the imagination. I just can't. I, it's one of the worst spots uh, of the entire NFL season. And, uh, again, it, you talked about the, the most profitable duo in the last 20 years. I'd make a strong case the most profitable duo in the history of the NFL when you're talking 60% against the spread, basically, since the two got it going at the end of the 2001 season. Uh, I'll, I'll more than gladly take a, a spot where it's basically saying these two teams are, are pretty much even. I, I'm just not buying it. I think this could be a spot that's worth you know a couple of points to the line that's not getting factored in appropriately. And, and we also got to consider you got a team from L.A., that's going to be playing in, what, high 20s <laughs> as far as the temperature goes. Uh, yeah, g- give me, give me, give me some New England. Uh, it- it'll be one of my bigger NFL bets of the year. Well, and I think this is one of those things, too. I, the quant crowd has to like the Chargers here because, I mean, there are some people, and, and you and I talked about this, I think, going into last week's game and, and maybe late in the regular season. There are some people that think that the Chargers were the best team in the NFL this year, you know, because of, of what they did on offense how balanced they were, the pass rush that they have on defense. You know, when healthy, there were some people that think that the Chargers are the best team in the NFL. And they're getting Hunter Henry back here, and, you know, we'll see what Melvin Gordon looks like trying to get loose in that cold weather. But I think that's really the thing here is that you kind of have the quant crowd a little bit against, you know, um, the, the crowd. It's talking about all the things that you and I talked about, the spot, Brady and Belichick, you know, Patriots at home all that type of thing. I, th- I think you, you just kind of have some philosophical differences in approach here, Ooh. which is the reason why yep. this line has moved down. Yeah, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't disagree with that either. I mean, the analytics guys, guys that like to lo- look at what the DVOA, I'm mean, going to see the chargers as the only team left uh, that have what a top uh, six, uh, seven, eight unit on both sides of the ball, better roster, uh, and, and I get it uh, that they're going to, analytically speaking, uh, the Chargers are the superior team. Uh, and and I, I guess I get that to a certain extent. Then you got the old school crowd saying, hey, the spot has to matter uh, to a certain extent. And also uh, the eye test from the last 15, 20 years. Uh, by all means, if you want to fade New England in this spot, uh, and sooner or later the dynasty is going to have to come to an end, I just don't think – this is the, the the spot to do it. So, yeah, I, I could agree with you why the line's only four. You, you got two contrasting styles when it comes to handicapping, new school versus old school. And, and I'm sorry, in this instance, uh, even though I'm only in my mid-30s, I'm more on the old school side. Well, and I think that it's, it's why this game in particular is so fascinating, why it's so complex, and, and also why if the Chargers do win, it's not like it's going to stun me, or if the Chargers do end up covering this game, I won't be stunned because they are a very, very good football team, and maybe they're a good enough team to overcome that Brady and Belichick history, the bad spot in this situation. But, you know, I mean, if they prove it to me, that's fine. But the difference is they have to prove it to me. So I'll probably wind up on New England here as well. Uh, but, again, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why I love this business, one of the reasons why I love being able to do this show because we can dig deeper into the second and third levels about these games and explain why the lines are moving the way that they are and sort of talk through all these different angles. That's kind of going back to what I talked about with the first game between the Colts and the Chiefs. You want to look at everything that comes into play for these games and decide what means the most to you. For some people, it may be that quant mathematical side where there's lesser gray area. For others, it may be the spot and, you know, what we know about the Patriots. And also, of course, as you mentioned, you know, how good they were at home uh, this year in the regular season and, and last year at home. So it's, it's just one of the reasons why I love this business. No question about it. And I'm going to throw one more thing out there. I know the Chargers have been really good at away from home, but 
they did win a couple of games, and kudos for them to, for winning and exceeding expectations in Pittsburgh and Kansas City. But if you're looking at those games, there was a couple of points in both of those games where the Chargers' chances of winning were less than 5% if you're doing the win probability. So I, I wonder, you know, a couple of coin flip games where they came out on top in, in, in the very end, had they not won those couple of games, what's this line? <laughs> Is it six? Uh, sometimes when you're looking to find value, uh, it, it, and the, the beauty of it is this time of year, you have extra time with there being limited games where you can analyze all the factors and really do some really big-time deep dives into it. Uh, keep that in the back of your mind when, when you're analyzing uh, how good the Chargers are. There's a couple of those road wins that were very fortunate. And even, uh, what, even the London game was very fortunate at the end, came down to the two-point conversion. All right, so let's go to Philadelphia and New Orleans here. The last game on Sunday, game 307-308. New Orleans, pretty much an eight-point favorite market-wide. Again, one of the more public shops, my bookie, still sitting at seven and a half. But for all intents and purposes, we're at eight on this game. Brad, the first question I want to ask you, Nick Foles, right? Whether it's perception or whether it's performance, he's having a big influence on this Eagles team, on the perception of this Eagles team, and on the betting market. What is this number if Carson Wentz is a starting quarterback instead of Nick Foles? Whew, that's a good point. I mean, well, we did see, uh, you know, these two teams play, what was it, week 11 in this building uh, with Carson Wentz at quarterback, and what was it, seven to seven to eight, depending on the Eagles took some money. Uh, I'm not sure at this point. I mean, I, I do think Carson Wentz is a better quarterback, but is he a better quarterback less than 100%? Uh, which I think he was for for this season, then Nick Foles probably not the the case. And uh, from an overall belief standpoint of a team, belief is a lot of things. I mean, it's it maybe not half the battle, but it's definitely part of the battle. And I mean, the the, the guys in the locker room uh, have been to war with Nick Foles and won uh, a championship and are winning again here. Uh, yeah, that's got to count for something. I'm not sure it's too different. I, I mean. Look, I, I think most people would say if all things created equal, at least come in the season, I mean, Wentz is probably two, three points better than Foles right now. I don't see much of a difference. I, I think the line's probably right where it is, eight. Uh, so no downgrade. And that's saying something because Wentz last year for, for the first, what, 10, 12 games of the season was the MVP of the league. So I, I don't think there's any downgrade at this point between Wentz and Foles. All right, so the line itself, minus eight. You mentioned that you'll probably have the Saints as part of a teaser to take them down to minus two. So we at least have that perspective on the game from you here so far in the segment. But what about the full game side here, sitting at minus eight? What do you think about the Saints and Eagles matchup in that regard? Yeah, it's tough for me, uh, eight. I just don't like laying it too much. The Saints are are deaf. I'll figure out what I want to tease, whether it be the Colts or the Rams. I got to decide there, and obviously strong on the New England side as well, but but teasing through four is just uh, not a smart bet. Uh, there's just not you're not teasing through uh, key numbers enough. But for me, uh, you know, my first factor is you know what's changed really since that 48 to seven win by the Saints, uh, you know, two months ago. On the defensive side of the Eagles. I don't see much change. This is still a team that I think has a lot of question marks, particularly in the secondary, where they've had 13 different starters this season in the secondary, most in the NFL. Uh, I get it there's been a a big-time change on the offensive side with Nick Foles, and they're playing confident on that side. But defensively, I mean, who have they played down the stretch that could take advantage of them? I mean, the Cowboys put up 550 yards uh, against them. Houston put up, uh, you know, 30 points. The Bears were unable to take advantage of that weakness for the Eagles. The, the Redskins in a pair of games playing with third and fourth string quarterbacks were unable to take advantage uh, of the Eagles in that regard. So uh, I, I'm not sure that, that this Philadelphia defense is a good matchup if you're looking to back them. Uh, on the flip side, the, the, the Saints, you know, had that three game road stand or that three game road trip where. You know, offensively, they were abysmal. But but was that the road trip or was that, you know, Drew Brees showing some age down the end of the season? I'm not sure what it was, but they didn't look good against Dallas, Tampa Bay, and Carolina on on offense. They rebounded immediately when they got back in the friendly uh, confines of the Superdome and put up 30-plus against the Steelers, and they've been a much better offense at, at home 
uh, at least down the stretch of the season. I, I think New Orleans gets their points. I think Philly can – maybe a lean towards the over for me and a small lean on the Saints and minus the eight. All right, so where does this number go? And I'm really Ooh. interested to see where this thing goes. As more public betters get involved over the weekend, and, and now that limits are bigger, we'll see some more sharp investment and sharp involvement on this game as well. You've got Philadelphia with Nick Foles, and, and they're putting up numbers with Nick Foles. Last week they did happen to win with defense, but you know maybe that was more about Mitch Trubisky and, and maybe some smoke and mirrors there. The New Orleans side, they've been winning with defense lately, except for at home, as you mentioned. So – I don't know where the public aligns on this game. I'm not entirely sure where sharp money comes in on this game. I don't know, man. What do you think? Yeah, I don't have a clear-cut, concrete answer. I, I, I can't see it being overwhelmingly tickets uh, on either side. And I know some people like to watch the, the betting tickets. I do I mean, because, I, you know, I like to see what the public side is. I, I see it being pretty much split. You know, 50-50 when it comes to the public betting tickets. We'll see the public really doesn't get involved until the weekend anyway, so that could change. Uh, we're talking through a lot of the handicappers here in Vegas, a lot of split uh, opinions on this one. I just I don't see this one moving too much, to be perfectly frank. I mean, I'd be stunned if it went down to seven. I really would, but, but I definitely don't see uh, the, the Saints uh, getting overwhelming action where it climbs. I think a lot of people – uh, are starting to believe in this, uh, you know, F- Philadelphia team again. So uh, I think if you put the gun to my head right now and say, wh- what's it close at? I think eight's a pretty good number. All right. So I didn't budget the time real well. I didn't realize we we're going to talk as much college football at the start of the segment as we did, but I do want to spend a couple of minutes here quickly on college basketball. And you, know, you don't do a whole lot with college basketball until college football is over. Then you make that transition to the hardwood. So Early on here, as, as you're getting your sea legs in the college basketball world, what is it that you're looking to take advantage of? A lot of it's, you know, believe it or not, situational and schedule spots. And I think you get some very unique ones here early on in January. Uh, when it comes to strength of schedule, I mean, let's say some college hoops, there can be some big-time disparities between non-conference scheduling. I'll give you a couple of examples from the last couple of nights. You know, first off, North Carolina, North Carolina State the other night, uh, saw North Carolina's strength of schedule about 300, 300 spots stronger than North Carolina State, uh, and yet North Carolina State, little brother, favored over big brother in that spot. So, uh, I mean, I'm looking for disparities uh, b- between uh, the strength of schedule because a lot of times the public gets involved as well, like me this time of year, coming fresh off of college football. What are they going to look at? They're going to look for the blue blood name brand teams, and they're just going to look at, at, at you know, records, straight up records, not ATS, straight up. And they're going to see a lot of instances where teams, tw- whoa, they're 12 and two. How can they be an underdog to a team that's, you know, eight and seven or, or nine and five? Uh, give me, give me the 12 and two team. They should be favored in this one. So a lot of times I pray uh, upon that perceived value uh, as far as strength of schedule, and then. Uh, some spots here, and there was a good one last night uh, between Houston and Temple, and I bring it up because Houston went down one of the last remaining unbeaten teams to go down. I mean, that was the first road game because a lot of these teams are playing, uh, you know, they're, they're off for a week when it comes to, to Christmas break. They don't play games for a week. They're playing some of these neutral site games, or they're just playing a bunch of weak non-conference teams all at home. Houston hadn't played a road game since December the 8th. So first game last night on the road for Houston in a month. Meanwhile, Temple hadn't played a home game in about three weeks. And and on top of it, Temple had played a much better strength of schedule, about 200 spots higher when it comes to the Kempom strength of schedule ratings. We saw, obviously, one of the last remaining unbeaten teams go down in the market you know, was all over Temple. Temple flipped to actually a favorite there. So and that's a couple things uh, I'm looking to take advantage of. And, you know, I, I'm very contrarian. So I love that the public is getting involved in ho- hoops. And, and I try to predict the, what the public, I put on my, you know, my uh, I, I'll put it, to, you know, I can just imagine the people walking down Fremont Street with, a, you know, a, a fried Twinkie or, you know, a corn dog and walking around and, I put myself in their shoes. Who would they want to bet? Well, they're going to want to bet Duke and Kentucky and Kansas, 
teams that have a past history. And a lot of times in the month of January, I find value fading those teams uh, this time of year. So that's a couple of things that that I look forward to uh, this time of year, Adam. Well, we'll definitely look to expand on that in future segments with Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com because, hey, you know what? We're going to be running out of NFL to talk about, and we're certainly out of college football to talk about. So we will be focusing a lot more on the college basketball side of things here with Brad. But, Brad, what do you got going on over at the website right now? No, still a lot of, uh, you know, football left. I mean, if you want to pick on all my games uh, through the Super Bowl and I get get your props and whatnot when it comes to the Super Bowl newsletter, uh, it's just 29 bucks for the rest of the season. 29 bucks. you're covered through the Super Bowl. Every single pick when it comes to the NFL playoffs, 63% winners this entire season, not straight up against the spread this entire season. Or you can early sign up for next year because we'll have some season win totals in just a few months in my opinion, up there, 69 bucks for next year, but just 29 bucks for the rest of the playoffs. Go to bradpowersports.com. And then what do you do with regards to uh, college basketball? Is that just only personal handicapping, or, or do you sell those well, as well? Well, h- here's the thing. When, yeah, that's great. I don't do a, a weekly newsletter with basketball. Just, I mean, it's tough to project forward for an entire week when you've got teams playing multiple games in a single week. So I have a daily VIP. Now, uh, the big difference in price point there. It's two ninety nine all the way through March Madness daily VIP picks compared to a weekly newsletter. So two ninety nine through March Madness college hoops VIP. And that's over at BradPowersSports dot com. And as always, you can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Powers and the number seven. Brad, appreciate the time as always, brother. Thank you so much for joining us, man. And we'll talk to you again next week. All right, sounds good, my friend. Take care.